And welcome back to day four of Connect Today. Connect Today's. I cannot believe that it has already been four days. I hope you've enjoyed this week just as much as we have. On Monday, one of our speakers, Pascal Viglino, mentioned that to innovate, one needs to be brave. I think he is right. And coming up with these two next sessions, we will need to be brave in order to innovate in the midst of these uncertain times. Um, we will need to be brave to rethink how we work. This will be the talk of the first session, the future of work. And we will need to be brave in making some serious commitments to ethics as the cornerstone to frame innovation. This will be the topic of our second ethic, our, our second session, ethics and innovation. Um, if you're tuning in for the first time this week, my name is Tiffany and I've been the host for this week. I am connecting live from Canada where I work with Connects to design impactful experiences. And I really hope this week has been um, and will be impactful for you and your organizations. Uh, thanks again for joining us. I also can't stress enough to make use of the conversation starter tool. If you haven't made your profile already, uh, we have sent a link to be able to make your profile. It is a great tool to schedule one-on-one -on -one meetings and connect with fellow attendees. We've had over 70 conversations so far and 196 people have registered. So it's a great way to browse the guest list and get to know some people. If you missed out on the sessions from the previous days, don't worry, they will, they are already on our YouTube channel. We will be adding that link below. Also, we wanna hear from you. There are Q and A's throughout the sessions. So stay tuned and write your questions in the Q and A button below. Uh, we will have different polls as well for this sessions, like the one that will pop up on your screen. Where are you all connecting from today? We wanna to know where it is that all of our viewers are coming from. It should pop up on your screen here. There we are. Where are you connecting from? Switzerland, mostly, very cool. And second, Canada. All right, I want to acknowledge the team effort here at Connext and all of the guest speakers that have joined us throughout the week. The theme of this series is short, insightful talks of innovation crisis. Our team wanted to take some time to reflect upon the events during 2020 and its impact on innovation. It is critical to think of innovative solutions and implement them into these global crises and need to do so with a critical lens because sometimes innovation itself can be a catalyst for more problems. We hope that you will leave these sessions with ideas to ponder and tools to help you navigate these challenging times. Now today, we are delighted to have with us Alexander Louyer, as well as Neil B. Croft. On the event website, you will find more of, about our speakers as well as their LinkedIn profiles, so you can head over there. Our first speaker is Alexander Louyer. He is one of our very own growth gurus at Connects. Thank you so much for joining us, Alex. Thank you so much, Tiffany, from this warm introduction. I will. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are here. Um, I hope you will also be able to yeah, see yeah. us now. Yeah, we Hello. can see you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So uh, greetings from the heart of the Swiss Alps. I'm here today with um, my old friend, I can call it like this. Young in, friend. Young friend but <laughs> for a few years now, uh, Neil B. Croft. And we will be talking about the future of work tonight. So um, for those of you who don't know Neil yet, Neil Bicroft is working uh, and at the, has been working at the interface of sport innovation and sustainability for more than 10 years now. In 2016, he was head of uh, sustainability during the UEFA uh, Euro Football Championship in France. Uh, this year, he also take this role of head of sustainability at the Lausanne uh, Winter Youth Olympic Games, and uh, is um, a Corp leader, accompanying uh, companies um, on their way to sustainability and uh, innovation to positively influence the organizational model of sports and the, the whole industry. 
since this year, he's also head of sustainability at the Omega European Golf Masters here in Montana. And he's the co-founder of the startup Pura Workout. Thank you, Neil, for welcoming us here uh, tonight at your new uh, venue. Uh, we are today at the Hotel des Vignes in Sion, uh, at the newly open uh, co-working space of Pure Orca. You have opened, when uh, was it? 3rd of November. So, so it's, it's brand new, fresh. still fresh. <laughs> and yeah, so Neil also achieved recently a certificate in disruptive innovation at the IMD uh, Business School. He will share also with us some of the latest uh, research that he has been done on the, this topic of uh, remote work. So today we will talk about the future of work, which is obviously a broad topic. Uh, let's have a look maybe at four trends that are already impacting this future of work. Uh, of course, automation and digitization. Um, it's hitting every aspect of many industries hard, opening also new opportunities. Uh, hiring roles, we see new jobs emerging that didn't exist a few years uh, a few years ago and and probably also new roles that we can't imagine uh, those days uh, this trend to have more temporary workers slashers you, you will be able also able to, to have um, a word on this and finally this big trend that we have seen emerging uh, especially in this crisis the remote work so for tonight um, I suggest that we focus on this trend of remote work all together to, to discuss what are the latest trends. We've made some research on the latest information of what is available on this trend. And if you like, we can also share with you a, a list of all the articles that we have been uh, able to, we had uh, to collect to set up this session. So before Looking into the future, uh, something that we like to do at Connex is take a few step backs and have a broader perspective on things, especially when it's about uh, innovation. So let's have a look at the history of, of work. So Neil, can yeah. you elaborate? Thank you very much, Alex, and uh, great to be here with you all. Uh, tonight, Alex and I, we studied together at high school, actually, and uh, there far was I to know that I would also study history to really understand uh, how our society works. And at IMD, I was really trying to think about, you know, how work has evolved over the last years. If you really think back, you know, now we talk about digital nomads, but naturally we were nomads. We used to travel the world and discover and change every day a destination. And then, you know, uh, progressively we, started to settle down. And then it was the early stages of working from home, manual activities. And then again, we had this rush again to go and discover new continents. And then we had to settle offices around uh, strategic places. So then an office started to emerge uh, at the early stages of colonialism uh, for trading, for other activities which needed more exchange between people. And then of course, over the years, as you can see on the chart, you had different influences, the open space, the Japan office, the German way of working. And uh, progressively this went to reach a certain limit where we had that urge again to work from anywhere. So the first cyber coffees, the first business centers came back. Then as we're doing tonight, teleconferences, we're still at the early stage. It was still, I would say, part of the pioneers again. What we're seeing as a trend right now is on one side going back to home. But the problem with social media is professional life is becoming part of your private life, as we see with WhatsApp, for instance. Same thing with home office coming directly in your private space. So now comes the moment where as TechCrunch article says, work from home can be dead, work from anywhere is hopefully the future. Bringing in practice actually hybrid models. Screens have the danger of bringing solitude. On one side, we can leverage the digital revolution to work from anywhere. 
and the co-working spaces and what we will explain to you further gives that opportunity to bring back and as connect said humanize business so that's mm -hmm. Uh, the introduction and thanks Alex I'll leave you the next slides. <laughs> Thank you Neil so and then as you said if you focus on the late uh, the last year so driven by technology we had the opportunity to go out of the office firstly work from home and now work from anywhere um, this year we all have been uh, embarked in a, a worldwide experiment uh, regarding work. Before the pandemic, uh, we estimate that these are mostly um, numbers that about Switzerland, um, that about 25% more or less of people have been working remotely. The, the vast majority, maybe for just one day, with two to 5% of people actually working from, from anywhere. And then uh, with the first lockdown, lockdowns, we came up to a situation where mostly half of all workers were working uh, remotely. And this, no, this number of 50% 50, 50 is quite interesting because it's the estimate of the, um, the share of jobs that could actually um, be done from, from anywhere. So we can say maybe that in the early month of 2020, we pushed this test to everybody who could have been working from anywhere. And then where are we today? There are a few studies that have asked these remote workers if they would like to keep working remotely after the pandemic. And 80% of these people uh, say, okay, I make this exper experiment, which was in an uncomfortable and mostly improvised uh, way. Still 80% of those people say, I would like to keep working remotely after the, the pandemic. So why? Let's have a look at the advantages and challenges of uh, remote work for, for, for people. Um, the studies we have looked at uh, mention uh, an increase in productivity, uh, workers being less uh, disturbed in their, their daily tasks, for example, less stress also, it can be the case uh, if you're working in um, an un uncomfortable environment, uh, also due to the, the, the fact that you need now uh, to, to do less commuting. You can focus more, you have more flexibility to render your schedule, uh, maybe also around your, your, your family, it will be easier than to organize. And also uh, less environmental impact, think of all the greenhouse gases, uh, emissions that you can avoid by staying at home, uh, avoiding unnecessary travels and doing as we are doing tonight, uh, video conferencing, for example. Of course, there is no ideal situation. The same um, respondents mention the following challenges. Uh, the danger of loneliness, being alone uh, at home, a decreased visibility um, in your company that came also mostly from younger um, workers that are early in their career and need the discontact with their peers to advance their career. Uh, it's also sometimes more difficult to coordinate the work among, among the, the team, uh, team members. And the, um, the challenge of distraction may be social media, the fridge or anything else, which not specifically linked to, to, the, to working at home or from anywhere. An unsuitable environment for work, uh, and the, the challenge of digital literacy. Um, in companies, you have probably people that don't master uh, digital tools that are needed to work, to be able to work remotely uh, in the same manner. So Neil, let's dive into the typical journey of a remote worker and have a look at their challenges that are facing. So maybe, maybe you're experimenting this uh, today so basically you wake up in the morning uh do you have to dress or not to dress big question that's the first <laughs> question you you ask yourself do you need to only put a shirt and then have shorts and flip-flops so these are the essential questions do you need to shave do you need to do your hair and these are kind of questions normally we wouldn't ask ourselves before there was a routine and then suddenly we break that routine 
And also we see that work enters into your house, you know, where you're gonna do your sessions, you know. Uh, these are questions that, you know, we broke suddenly big habits. Do you need to brush your teeth? Do you need to shave? Do you need to put a tie? And all of these questions emerge and we didn't really have time to get ready for this. Um, breakfast, yes, no. Do you have to go running? Uh, the phone, do I master those tools? Um, how do I manage collaboration with my teammates? I miss my teammates. I'm happy I don't see my teammates. All of these questions and children coming in, maybe, you know, Switzerland has the chance. We have the chance to have a laptop. Maybe there's only one laptop for the whole family. Who gets priority? How do we organize ourselves? When will we come back? And mm -hmm. all of these are questions that are influencing our daily job. And so basically there's a real need for companies, for individuals to structure, to bring structure in this without having had the time to create this structure, without having the knowledge of this structure. And it's really a turning point, a key point where at the same time we have more freedom, we can work from anywhere, but there's very little guidance that are brought by the companies that are also out there. So it's really interesting moment. And I think what we had forecasted at Pura Warka has been accelerated with this mm -hmm. crisis. And recently I participated to a remote work summit where I could see new titles in major companies, remote work, HR officer, in many different ways, talent manager with remote hat. And all of these people have been writing policies. All of those new jobs are out there. And whatever we think that there will be two steps back, there has been 10 steps forward. Everything that has been created there, you know, whether companies are gonna finance just the lease of a flat, mm -hmm. the furniture, the screens, and all of these questions are being out there. And mm -hmm. that's the little compliment yeah. I could bring. As, as you mentioned now, the, the company side, let, let's have a look at the, at the companies. What are the advantages that's mostly um, uh, advanced by companies? Why they want to promote work from any of policies? Uh, so this productivity increase is um, often mentioned. Um, the need for, for employee retention, of course, if we see that 80% of workers wish to be able to work from, from anywhere after the pandemic or so, uh, you have to put in place uh, policies that would enable this to retain your talent. The cost of optimization potential has been evaluated in, in the um, estimated in the various studies that we have looked at to be between five to ten thousand dollars per month per, uh, per work uh, workstation. And the last one, the, this talent pool. I mean, yeah, major corporations, you know, were restricted in a certain way to local laws in terms of recruitment. You know, how many Swiss people could a company recruit versus Europeans versus other uh, origins? Nowadays, all of these questions are being challenged because if you can work remotely, what stops you from recruiting an employee from abroad? And all of this is really disrupting a lot of major corporations who could well have their headquarter in Switzerland, but now have found a way to recruit internationally, bypassing some of the physical laws that could well be in place. Mm -hmm. This famous one to one and hour and a half radius uh, around your headquarters or your office that you had so far, for example. Yeah. Exactly. And will those companies be able to also open satellites? Uh, in uh, other countries or be able to work from outside the city center. Mm -hmm. And this is really interesting how these trends yeah. are evolving. That well, the, the, the fact that, that push the remote work uh, policies on the side of the, um, the company so far, we, we also had this, this great um, BCG uh, analysis uh, that tried to, to quantify these advantages. And when we talk about 20, percent 
plus uh, potential for cost reduction in real estate and resource usage that we can imagine the, the potential and the impact on the finances of, the, of those companies. We talk about 40% reduction in absenteeism. She also questioned us on the way we today manage uh, people if you reduce by 40% the absenteeism. Uh, this reduction in turnover 10 to 15% has been observed. Uh, and uh, the increase in productivity, which is still in debate. I mean, it depends also on which sector you have. Uh, you have not clear what the effect on productivity actually here is. It's still on debate, but yeah, so potential that is recognized at least by the companies. Of course, there are some drawbacks, challenges in terms of management. I don't know what you, you think, but for me, that probably be the main challenge for companies is to adapt the managing style and their corporate culture to this approach of, of, uh, of remote work, the way you set up your, your goals, the way you manage your, your teams. Yeah, the challenges of trust is because before we had this kind of stereotypical notion of trust that because the person was in the office, the hierarchy control could have more influence and power. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, people were scared that if you were to work remotely, you would be on your social media, you would be distracted, but it doesn't mean you're at the office, that you're not going to go on your social media, that you're not going to be distracted by the cafeteria and the colleagues and mm -hmm. other uh, people. So really the challenge of management and trust and having the right tools to be able to collaborate with different time zones as we're doing now with Canada is, is really a, an interesting issue. Mm -hmm. An, another issue that was uh, often mentioned was um, the difficulty also uh, in terms of security. When you think that you, um, I don't know if you, if you remember something isn't right, we have a, an issue there, but I will continue from there. Uh, <laughs> um, we were talking about security. Remember this bring your own device policy, the, the famous BYOD policy. Did you experience this? Yes. Um, well, one concrete example. I was talking to some friends who were working in a major Swiss bank. And with my concept here, I work out, I was trying to pitch to them. And they were like, Neil, there is no chance because with our bank, it's always the same excuses that they would say. There's the notion of transparency, of security, of confidentiality. And we don't see this going fast and further in the next month to come. With COVID in five days, they had all their equipment installed and they were able to then be able to work from anywhere. It went even to the point that the dress code of the bank, one of the most traditional bank in Switzerland, totally switched. And so they could suddenly wear like trainers. They didn't have to wear a tie because they were going to meet people in hotels, in other places across Switzerland. And this is super interesting to see that mm -hmm. there's no gonna, there's no way back on this. Of course, you know, uh, they will go back to the office, but they won't go to a five to five days per week mm -hmm. office. They won't go to a really formal dress code. Mm -hmm. And this really has accelerated. So yeah. challenge, which was there before, was kind of broken mm -hmm. by, uh, but they will still stay there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, so, so when you're talking about tools, so uh, that was also something that we saw um, in, in March. We had a few clients that, um, that asked us, okay, we need to, we have to move now online. Can, can you help us in this way? And we quickly set up a list of the, the best tools for the job. We, we made it in a, in a in toolkit that you, you can also, if it's helpful for you, um, you can download it. Joan will post the, the link to the, to the kit in the, in the chat right now. Uh, we made a list of what we use at Connect, what we saw and how they could be useful to to do all these activities that that you normally has to do um, from your office, but actually you should be be able to to manage from from anywhere. Um, so we see that on the worker side, there is this push for, for remote work. That the advantages on the, the the company side seem to be also uh, more important than the, the challenges. Uh, so this trend is. I mean, this trend is there to, to stay. And we saw it 
it um, during the last weeks and months uh, with these big announcements from tech giants in Silicon Valley and other big or smaller uh, companies all around the world that change these, their, their policy and ex expand this temporary uh, work from anywhere policy to be uh, permanent. And what was interesting to see as well that the remote work was tried at home, but then employees started to, to question whether the work from home could well be extended outside the border. So we're seeing now examples, and you may have some in your relatives, is people actually working in major companies saying, okay, I go to the Canary Islands, mm -hmm. and over there I might have to stay locked in for a couple of days, but because I know that the lockdown in my home country is three months, why should I not go in the Canarians? Why should I not go to a ski resort in Switzerland? Do your couple of days locked in and then continue working remotely from those tourism destinations. Mm -hmm. And it's really shifting the mindset of uh, remote work and breaking the boundaries. Even some countries adapting their legislation to create digital nomad visas. Mm -hmm. And that's super interesting trend to follow. Yeah, talking about tourism. so. Uh, one the, the, this um, this image on the on the left hand side of the of the screen from Dubai to Dubai tourism that's something that pop up in my LinkedIn feed when I was doing my research for this presentation to, uh, tonight. So as you said, we see uh, locations that try to position them th themselves uh, on this trend of rem remote work and work from any anywhere. Uh, we talked yesterday with uh, Renaud Juinier from Connect also. Uh, about this, um, yeah, this place, trend, branding. place branding strategies also for, for for those kind of destinations. Airbnb is also shifting their their offering to 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 be able to offer infrastructure to those uh, remote workers and digital nomads you mentioned. Uh, we see uh, hotel companies like Citizen M, uh, who was now also adapt their offering to be able to offer. Uh, daylight stays uh, to be able to work also in their in their hotels and that's that's also why i wanted to to invite you tonight because with pure Avoca, that's also the um, the segment where you are uh, positioning yourself and investing can you explain a bit more to us and to all the the community of connects that is now uh, online what you do at pure Avoca? Thank you very much, Alex, for really setting the whole foundation to uh, the idea, actually, we had maybe, I would say, about four years ago, where uh, I was working in event management. I still do it now as a consultant, but before I was doing it as part of one of the major uh, federations worldwide. And in event management, you don't really realize that behind a football pitch or behind an Olympic stadium all industries meet whether it's this textile industry the building industry the food industry the transport and i you can name them all all of these are supply chain to professional sport so a lot of my colleagues were responsible for ticketing for accommodation for uh, logistics and all of this was done remotely from switzerland until maybe one month before the event started off uh, so the european football championships which is equivalent to 51 Super Bowls over a period of one month. So in terms of numbers, in terms of scale, it was quite massive. So for a duration of four years, we were working remotely and then going to France when it was needed. So there I was really thinking, well, why do we do it from Neo? Uh, I was looking at Bali and Bali were already adapting their business model to welcome backpackers 2.0 and offering them yoga and surf and, and keeping them a bit longer. And I was thinking, well, in the Alps, we have everything to welcome people. Mm -hmm. So we have great ski resorts and summer is quite nice, biking is coming in. Also another important and interesting uh, theme we were looking at with Jérôme Salamin, who's also connected with, you know, this climate change migration. I don't know if you experiment this in Canada, but summertime, with increase of the temperatures to work in a city becomes more and more difficult 
in terms of breathing, in terms of temperatures, in, in terms of AC. So we asked ourselves, how could we welcome all of these people temporary, a bit higher in the ski resorts, offer them not just an office, but give them an ecosystem uh, activities, which could be sports, which could be culture, wine tasting, also part of culture, very important. As you can see, our glasses <laughs> nearly empty, but workshops. So we collaborated as well with Neuron, with Connex to create workshops. One concrete example, Richard Branson has a lodge in Verbier. He drives or takes the plane or whatever a couple of times per year to go in one of the big ski resorts. And he never has a place where he can meet you know, all of this intelligence, which is happening in Bali, all this mm -hmm. innovation. And you don't need to be Richard Branson. A lot of um, senior positions or people coming to our ski resorts and we're very good at taking their money, but we were not very good at taking their brains. And also locally, we have a lot of talents yeah. and we mm -hmm. cannot retain those talents because they go abroad, they go to Canada, they go to <laughs> Zurich, they go to Lausanne because they've no space to really exploit or put to benefit their talents. So then the idea of having a co-working space where you could have these activities to attract people, to keep them longer, but also to create exchanges between the locals and the digital nomads was for us really the vision of saying, okay, well, how can we reshape, rethink work and bring lifestyle and really create a structure where if you're at your chalet, if you're at home, you're with your families and you're with your friends or you're with your partners. And then you don't need to go far. You don't need to take an hour train to go to another city. You can walk for five or 10 minutes, put yourself in a condition where you can exchange great projects. So really this was the genesis of Pure Worker about three years ago. We had to have the business card. So we chose Zermatt, which you may know of the Tobleron Mountain. Uh, has a rock which is still there, won't move for a couple of years. So we could launch the project there. And then we needed other iconic destinations. So Lombok being the twin sister island of Bali, focusing a bit more on sustainability. Mm -hmm. And people say, okay, well, you know, you're encouraging people to travel more. And actually, no, we're keeping people longer. So people anyway come to our resorts, yeah. people will anyway go to Indonesia. People will have their children having two months of holidays. And the, the idea behind is, you know, stay longer. Mm -hmm. So don't work during your holidays, please. I'm sure you do it. <laughs> I do it, unfortunately, but stay longer. And so your partner can be happy. The children can be happy. And so really this idea was to say, okay, well, how can we reshape the notion of work, yeah. bring some structure, bring a frame, and have exchanges, put human back at the center. So you need to have these activities around. And the next steps are gonna to be to look at schooling. You know, mm -hmm. uh, more and more children are being taken off for a year, but then they have the same challenges as you were saying, loneliness. Uh, children want to play with children. So why can children not go and do all the practical elements of schooling with local schools in Bali, in Zermatt, you know, whether it's going to be sports, whether it's going to be surfing, permaculture, skiing, drawing. And so they have exchanges with local school, as kids, and then they will be able to follow an online course. Yeah. So they keep part of the system, mm -hmm. but they interact and they have the human interaction. Mm -hmm. And then the food as well are really the next things we're going to look at to try to evolve with the latest technologies, with the latest evolutions, but always to bring back human at the center. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we look forward to welcoming you either here or in Indonesia or in next uh, destinations will open. And we're very happy to be able to discuss with you tonight and uh, to see what next will happen. Thank you very much, Neil. Um, as, you, as you say, as a, I heard that I really much like it, that it's also not, uh, that this trend of remote work enables also to to mix the brains and uh, a trend that is born in um, in the midst of a, a crisis to foster innovation also that is you know, so now the topic of uh, of today uh, Joanna are you there I am right here Alex I'm right here Neil thank you very much for this uh, presentation both of you 
And I'm glad to see you guys are in Switzerland having uh, some glasses of wine there. That looks uh, very nice. Um, I wish I could be there too to enjoy it with you guys, but we'll uh, do it virtually. Um, thanks for the presentation. And I'll, I'll ask first a question and then we'll have a Q&A for the, for the participant. Uh, Alex, you did mention that uh, when we, we move to a remote work type of setting, it increased productivity. Um, and I, I think I agree, it increased productivity, but then it seems that at the end, we just work more. So I really like the, the setup that Dean is suggesting. It's not only co-working, but it's also co-living to, mm -hmm. to promote this, um, this idea of co-living. Um, but it seems to me that to be able to finance uh, this co-living and to make it sustainable uh, financially in the long term, we'll have to make sure that as we increase productivity, um, that we can benefit from the, the digital tools that we use. We automatize a lot of things. Uh, we are more productive, but how can we benefit uh, even more? Because it seems now, I'll give you an example. It seems now, like if you take an example, 10 years ago, I'll have to organize a conference like this. I'll have to, um, or maybe let's say 20 years ago, I'll have to write letter and mail it. It will take forever. But now I gain so much time by just using email. But that mm -hmm. time I've gained, I didn't gain it just for me to increase my co-living. I just work more. Yeah. So I'm wondering if we have to move. I, I think the, the underlying question I'm getting at that is, do we have to move to um, a system, a revenue or an income system that makes us uh, benefit uh, more? And even it could be something like universal basic income or some sort of income that, that help finance this co-living. Any thoughts on, on, on this uh, lengthy, lengthy question? <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Um, yeah, I mean, what, what you say that that's right. The the tech the, the leverage that technology gives us, uh, it, it's tremendous. And uh, then it's also our I mean, our individual um, choice uh, to decide what we do with this precious time that mm -hmm. we gain. Uh, if we want to to work more, as you said, or use it for another purpose, time which is the the only uh, non-renewable uh, resource that we all have. Um, so that's the question for, for we as individuals. And then as a society, wh where do we want to put uh, these productivity gains? Is it to gain even more or to achieve new goals, uh, to share them? Neil, what do you, what's your, your take on that's this a, topic? It's a very interesting. You talked about um, also um, on... Uh, basic income, I know that's a yeah. topic that you study. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. If you look at major corporations, and I think the trend coming from North America, bringing in the lifestyle as part of your uh, services to your employees, you know, giving yoga lessons, having a gym, you know, even having uh, a nursery and making, you know, the lifestyle becoming part of the company headquarters and which has a lot of dangers because it's going to increase, of course, the productivity, uh, but also it's going to expose more staff to burnouts because the more they work, the more they want, and the more we expect from them. And, uh, and I guess really this idea of having the work from anywhere provides you that potential of more flexibility. So, you don't need to go to the office from eight to five or eight to eight or whatever crazy rhythms you would have, but you can focus on project deliveries. Mm -hmm. And around that you, you put in like some slots where you know that you're going to run one hour and you really make sure that you create a habit out of this. Mm -hmm. So every lunch time, every day at 10, you have either your yoga class or your, running and then you organize your video conferences around this and if you can collaborate with your team and you know that every monday is with your team and this is an opportunity and it's very important to create a habit if you're working from anywhere that you manage to block these times mm -hmm. and very frankly on a personal basis i've been pushing for this ideal work lifestyle and 
myself, I've had the biggest issues in implementing it myself. But until I realized that I had to be very strict on creating moments where I do go run, where I maybe I spend time with friends. Mm -hmm. And I think because now this blend and fusion of work and private life is there, make sure that you dedicate a lot of time on private moments for your weekends as well. Because as Joanne, you were saying, you know, if you're working anyway from home, why sh shouldn't you work on Saturday and Sunday? Is there still a Monday? Is mm -hmm. there still an evening? Mm -hmm. And as you were saying, then the challenge of this universal revenue, of course, well, will happen very soon, is already out there. And maybe that's the opportunity to bring more creativity. And so if you can block time for sports and activities, maybe you can block time for new projects as well. And just focus on deliverables, because anyway, you cannot trust that people are now in an office from eight to five. So why not make that total switch of not counting hours, but purely focusing on deliverables. Mm -hmm. And if you can achieve those deliverables in a certain amount of time, and as you were saying quite well, the more we work, the more, the faster we are going to go. So why not slow down the pace? Do you really need to achieve all of this in one day, in one week, or why not create two weeks time to achieve those goals? And then you can, of course, plan a bit more free time for new projects, for uh, personal life. And I think that's a very important time now to reorganize the work. Reorganize, as you were saying, Joanne, how the revenues and how the universal revenues will come in, because it's just a matter of time. And uh, it's going to be quicker than we thought. Thank you. And I think uh, I think it relates and makes me think that we could have a session uh, uh, we haven't done it, but who knows, maybe there was going to be the next day, 2021. Uh, we could have a session on digital well-being. Uh, and I've seen that uh, we've organized some hackathon, online hackathon, where we've uh, we created some, um, some um, yes, yeah, some session on digital well-being and also disconnecting and, and all of these things. So I think those were important. And uh, just for all of you that have joined us, now feel free to ask questions on the Q&A box. And here I have a question that that relates to uh, to what we just talked about from Shane, who's asking, please comment further on measuring productivity. How must companies change their ways of measuring workers and pro and project productivity in a remote work environment? Because we don't have, uh, we don't see uh, our workers, right? They're not in the office, they're remotely. So how can we, can we check uh, on yeah. their productivity? Well, good question. Um, because it, it, it relates to the, um, the challenges we, are, we talked about when um, talking about the, um, the challenges of, of companies and, and management in, in a specific way. Because uh, we have uh, a measure, we measure work mainly in, in work hours, which is this um, system of measuring work that comes from the, the industrial revolution when we have workers working on the line. And you can estimate uh, in a definite, definite, definite uh, amount of time how many um, pieces of work they will achieve. But if you think of creative works, um, work in the services industry, or knowledge works, it's extremely hard to measure work and output and productivity uh, in terms of hours work. And how? Could managers uh, adapt their, their management? I, I think the best way is to think about what uh, do I want my, my team to achieve? What should be the output? When should it be uh, delivered? And then let people organize the way they, uh, they want. Uh, that's the way I, I see it. I don't know if you yeah, have there's, another um, in that. Also, in another angle to, to bring to the answer is the community. And uh, imagine just per person, think about yourself, how many hours per day, per week, per year are you spending commuting or where are you spending commuting, even on a day? Uh, and that, what do you do now out of this time you've saved? Mm -hmm. And also, when is the most productive moment of your own personality? And, and studies have shown that the morning is the moment where majority of people are more performing. You may be more productive in the evening at now, uh, you know, in the evening. So actually people are finding their own best productivity time. 
-hmm. and their saving time of commuting, which they're investing maybe in doing sports, maybe in sleeping, maybe in spending social moments, which is contributing as well to their well-being. And of course, there's also a lot of downsides on this, but basically it means that they're saving time. They're investing this time, hopefully, in more fruitful manners, and that increases their productivity potential. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you both. And 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 now to to move on the with the conversation, I'd like to. There's two questions that came up that that want to tackle more on the the challenges or maybe even the negative um, uh, elements that can come with remote work. One of them is related to the environment, and then the other one is to relationship. So the first one, uh, let's talk about relationship. And one um, one attendee here, Daniel, is asking. Um, he, what he's missing uh, from working from home is the unplanned encounters in his workplace with people that are not necessarily in his team. Um, and sometimes those unplanned encounters can bring new inspiration, new ideas. So how, how do you think you can do this online when if you just if your team is only on Slack and you just have your team, how can you meet other people or people from um, yeah from other teams? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a very good point because uh, that's that's also what we were asking ourselves when we set up the, these connect days. Uh, one of the, the the main value of going to uh, to to a conference is these informal interactions that you get with your the other attendees and all this serendipity and what can come from uh, out of all these uh, uh, unexpected encounters. Uh, I think we're still experimenting. Uh, we put in place for this session the this conversation starter tool, which was um, okay. That's uh, an attempt that we made <laughs> to find a solution. Um, honestly, I still haven't found uh, either um, an effective way to foster this unexpected interaction. Yeah. Neil, do you have any? I mean, experience there. I think we were forced to create online digital meetups, whether it was families, whether it was birthdays or even weddings or, and I think we reached our limit. Mm -hmm. You know, there's great ways to exchange, which can be a conference like now, which can be a team meeting, but there's been a limit to where social interaction doesn't want to go yet. Yeah. A birthday uh, should be shared together but yeah. we've had to make this extra effort so there's a place as well for a certain buffer so mm -hmm. a certain hybrid model and this is why on our side we believe a lot in these co-working spaces mm -hmm. where you can work remotely but you can also have this social interaction so for employees you know uh, that have to come back to either a 250 500 people office why not start by coming back to a co-working space, which maybe has 20 people mm -hmm. and add other people from other industries exchanges, exchanging with them, you know, same thing for teachers. Teachers who are gonna go back, why, why should they not work uh, from co-working spaces? And this is really why we believe in this human at the center uh, and to these buffer zones. If you look at burnouts, burnouts, when you will have to come back from a burnout, you know, is it going to be easier to go back directly to your company or maybe to a co-working space in Bali with people who don't know you, who don't know your background, or going to, you know, even a local co-working space where you're going to meet fresh people, you're going to do your daily job without having the stress of seeing your colleagues. So, you know, I do believe that there are intermediate and buffer zones. Uh, we should not go from one extreme to the other as we were forced to do. But we have to find these hybrid uh, moments and exchanges and solutions and put a lot of emphasis on this. Yeah, yeah. I think, we can, yeah, we, we, we can thank Daniel for this question because uh, something that was maybe not that clear in the, in the, in the discussion so far is that there, are, there is room for, for hybrid models, as you say. It's not either 100% office or 100% remote, but combining the advantages and drawbacks from all these uh, solutions, I mean, that's the way to go. Yeah, I think that, and that's what makes the Pure Hour Worker, in my opinion, unique. It's the co-working and co-living uh, and emphasizing on, on both aspects to have this 
digital well-being or this work life balance or, or however you want to call it and then the, the last question here it's also again about maybe the negative side of remote work uh, justin is asking has your research led you to explore the negative environmental implication of remote work and he's thinking about the energy consumption associated with servers everyone has to go on zoom uh, what's the energy cost there as well as environmental effects of mining rare earth metal needed for those technologies, mm -hmm. the manufacturing processes needed for the phone and so on. So is the is remote work um, mm -hmm. if environmentally more friendly or have we created another monster? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. I mean, at the end of the, of the day, there is no free lunch. And here we trade uh, long haul flights for Zoom meetings. Neil, you're a sustainability expert. What's your what's your take on that? Yeah, no, it's a fantastic question because it's actually be it will be my biggest innovation, which I want to bring as part of the the topic of sustainability. We're still in the stage. I don't know where where you live in the world. We're really pat our back because we're putting in place a, a bamboo straw. We're very happy to be zero waste at home and. We think it's trendy and same at work, same in events, same in policies, you know, you know, uh, a city said, oh, we've banned plastic bottles. And you have all these uh, social media influencers who are zero waste uh, advocates. And at the same time, everyone's on Netflix. And if you were to uh, compare Netflix to a country in terms of energy consumption, it's the third biggest country worldwide. So. Of course, uh, it's moments where I think now we have to understand how many flights and how much the, the big impacts have been saved and put the other major impacts which are coming in there uh, at the forefront. And a lot of companies that have done a lot of money are actually having a very negative impact in terms of uh, carbon footprint due to their digital footprint. And if you're looking at Switzerland, at the same time, we became over history rich with the banks. We hosted a lot of money from different countries around the world. And now what is happening is we're creating digital banks. So we're mm -hmm. investing in a lot of servers and places and farms because we have hydroelectricity and we're welcoming a lot of GAFAs to, to invest there um, for a lot of reasons. So I think it's a very, interesting point and a turning point where there will be the questions of 5G as well coming in and looking at the digital footprint. And hopefully this has accelerated the thought of this because you know Netflix was already out there. Mm -hmm. And people who maybe were not thinking about their footprint on Netflix will be asking those questions you were raising because of the work footprint. And, uh, and I believe that is still a taboo, still hidden for different reasons. Probably a lack of awareness, but uh, that definitely needs to search uh, because the impact is so massive. Mm -hmm. so, and the big question would be, uh, at the end of the day, what is the, the global uh, trade-off out there? Uh, positive or not upset? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And then uh, to, to, end up, to end this session, I, I'd like to thank you, uh, first of all, both of you to taking the time here and the, the evening to spend it with us. Um, and I'd like to ask the, the attendees, we'll have a poll coming up and um, with three questions. We'd like to know what, um, where is your favorite place of work? What is the ideal amount of remote work for you? And could you imagine extending your vacation and spend more time working remotely from a tourist destination? And then would you consider moving if you could do uh, if you could um, do your current work from from anywhere? So four question. Take some time here to to answer, and then we'll uh, we'll look br uh, briefly at the poll <coughs> before we sorry before we we end this session and and start the the next one. The polls are coming in. All right, I'll just wait a little bit more. Don't hesitate to, to vote. This is your chance to vote. 
<laughs> yeah, and those who haven't done it in Switzerland, please do so. Um, very important vote coming this uh, weekend, which could change as well the world. There's vote in the US too, lately I heard, and in British Columbia, Canada. This vote here is not as important though, but <laughs> we'd like to hear from you. Everywhere. All right, so where's your favorite place of work? Anywhere. Anywhere, so that's that's good to know, Neil. Anywhere, so let's uh, have some pure work uh, workstation anywhere. Uh, what is the that ideal amount of remote work for you? Um, so that only a few want to only work remotely, and I think that's understandable. People still want this human connection that we've talked about, but still quite a bit. Hey, eh, when you look at the percentage, forty five percent want to want to remote uh, work remotely, although our our polls might be super biased because of, of the people that are attending are probably already like um, working remotely and, and uh, like to uh, the, the digital remote work setup. Could you imagine extending your vacation? Um, uh, could you, yes, people love vacation, of course. And would you consider moving if you could do? And also, yes. So I think, uh, I think yeah, we can see that um, how this session was looking at the answers, how this session was was important and how um, pure worker model is, is onto something. Uh, so again, thank you very much, uh, both of you. Enjoy the, the rest of your evening in Switzerland. And I see some glasses are empty. So, um, so we'll take care of that. We'll uh, take care of this uh, very well. So thank you both. And uh, I think Tiffany will, will come back and make some an announcement for the second part of the evening or of the day, depending on where you are. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank, you, thank very much. you so much, gentlemen. All right, thank you for joining us for the first session of our fourth day here at Connects Days. We will be having a short break, so join us back in just a couple of minutes to learn about how ethics, about ethics and innovation. We will see you shortly. <laughs>